Yeah, okay, great. So we can get started. So, so guys, today we'll be we will be discussing about uh, the second part of our NoSQL database series and continuing to our previous topic, which was MongoDB last time, which was a document based NoSQL database. This time we will be uh, discussing Cassandra, which is a key value based database and we will be having uh, a, a small tutorial on cybers. So let's get started. So Cassandra is a NoSQL database, which is a distributed system architecture. And what, what I mean by distributed system architecture is that uh, the same data is available to different nodes here so that there is no concept of primary database or primary node or a secondary node. Each node has equal importance. And why is, why is that? Because this database uh, has a concept called always available. So if one node goes down, then still you can work on work on it. So what happens is that in like stand, like in SQL database, if something goes down, then like everything goes down. But here, since everything is connected to each other, let's say due to hardware failures or or anything else, if one thing goes down, but still you can uh, connect your data and query and use it. And, 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 and the architecture is like every node is like the smallest physical item where there is a copy of data available and, and it's connected to each other. Like for example, in the image, if you see, let's say there is this node, which is the smallest physical item of a cluster, and it's equal to all the nodes. And if you want to fetch some data, the user or the client will connect to it and then it will and send their queries. And Cassandra has something like CQL, which is Cassandra query language, which is very similar to uh, uh, SQL queries. But, but the main difference between Cassandra and the SQL is that Cassandra doesn't have a fixed schema of tables. Like you can have a dynamic schema or you can just edit schemas on the go for Cassandra tables. And another thing is that Cassandra tables do not have joins. And Cassandra is more of a database where, which is designed on the queries perspective. So what happens is that in SQL database, you have a database and then you think of a query to extract the data. Cassandra, in Cassandra, it's the other way around that first you think or plan that what queries you are most, or what queries would be run like multiple times or what queries client would run. And then based on the queries you design your database schema. Okay, let's, let's go and uh, compare MongoDB and Cassandra. So why is it uh, useful to learn Cassandra that Almost every top tech company uses Cassandra, whether it is Netflix or Spotify, because all of the users are always logged in all over the world and you don't want to mess up things if one of the nodes goes down. So if if one if let's say there is something goes on to goes wrong into the servers at one location, but still the data is present at every other location. So that then and that's how users can just access to all of the Netflix or Spotify. Uh, media all, all around. And that's why it's called an always available type of service. And it's different than MongoDB where you have mostly e-commerce websites where you have, or let's say Airbnb or Amazon where you have product and and its features located. Yeah, let's talk about features. So again, in MongoDB, like we discussed last time, there things are indexed and, and it follows a primary and secondary architecture, but there is no primary and secondary architecture in Cassandra. Everything is considered the same. And again, it follows that it's uh, the media or the content should always be available and should be scalable. And in Cassandra, we'll look at all the examples of crude and let's go back to our Cyber's notebook to understand crude, which is create, create, read, update, and delete options on a database. So Let's go back here. Okay, so once you have this notebook open, you can go to file here and then go to new and go to terminal and just launch Cassandra. Since it's a database server, it will run on your 
local host yeah let's wait for some time does anyone have any questions before we start our notebook okay so once this is up and whenever we say that we never see that okay the node is running and everything looks okay we can just go back to our a uh, notebook and uh, uh start uh, start with a tutorial so like as we discussed cassandra is an open no sql database and the main thing is that the, the whole focus is on continuous availability that you, you don't, uh, like if something goes down in one region, you still want to have something up to cater for that region. And so, uh, and so first we'll install this Faker library, which is used to generate some data set, which we will put into our uh, Cassandra database to query later. So you can just run this one first. Yeah, once it's installed, uh, we'll run the Cassandra cluster uh, and Cassandra authorization. Uh, what these libraries is that it will help us to connect using this Python Jupyter notebook to this uh, database, which is running at your, in the backend. Once you have it in run. And, and since this is running on your local host, what you do is you have this, uh, call this cluster uh, class here and then pass on your IP of the local host and say session is cluster.connect. Yes. And so initially, uh, like what we discussed in SQL and uh, MongoDB is that everything is termed as a database, but in Cassandra database, the same thing is termed as key spaces. So before uh, running any command, we would like to know what key spaces are available as default in uh, on this uh, Cassandra server. So we run this uh, port cell and we know that all there are at least like six or seven key spaces available, which are all system related. And now we will start with our faker object to use it later to put uh, data into our uh, key space. Okay, since these are all default key spaces, we need one key space for us to make, to create some data set. So the next command would create a key space. And right now, since for this tutorial, we just have like our own servers uh, or, or this uh, or the Cybers Docker image. So we'll just put like a simple strategy and replication factor one, which means that you have only one node and it's copied only one time. So let's say if, if you, are working for a production environment, ideally you would use a network topology structure. As we saw in this uh, image that this there is this network and uh, and the corresponding replication factor, we have put one here, which means there will be only one copy of the data, but in development environment, you will put it like, let's say like three or four, or let's say like six or seven, like for example here. So then all of the nodes are connected to each other and then you will have uh, each node will have a copy of data set. Like I said, if one node goes down, then the other will work so that the data is available every time. So using this command, we can have this key space, which is named as user data here. Okay, and for this example, uh, we'll have uh, three uh, three tables here, user, user profiles, activities, and preferences. So for example, let's say you have a website where there are lots of users they perform some activities and then you're logging their data onto the website let's say for example they are wearing a wearable sensor and then you are uh, or, or like for example strava where you have all the activities of a person recorded so so to emulate that we have this user profile activities and preferences table here and one by one, we will make these tables and push data into it. So let's start with user profiles. So if you see the command, it looks like very similar to SQL commands. It says like if create this table if it doesn't exist and then we are naming our table as user profiles. And now we are mentioning the columns and the data type. 
So for user table column, we have this user ID, and then we are mentioning that it, it would be of the form of this UID, which is a primary key. So then using that primary key, we can index this database so that we can query it later. And the attributes we would have in this user profile is name, email, and age. And so once we run it using this uh, session.execute command, and then we parse the CQ, CQL query inside this command, and once we run it, uh, it will say, okay, it has, it, it has the user profiles table created. Same goes for user activities and user preferences. For user activities, we again have an activity ID. For example, let's say, let's take the example of Shrava again. If the user is like walking or running, then they would be termed as different activities. And then you have user ID, which will say, okay, if this activity, like who, which user did that? So then you have this user ID here. You have activity type that based on the activity, then you have a timestamp and then details about those activities. Similarly for preference data, and you can assume that this is for, let's say the front end that if the users want to try to log into their app, then what kind of features they would think. So we will define those uh, features later when we push the data inside. And just to verify that all of these tables are present, uh, all of the, our key space is present inside the, uh, in Cassandra and the tables are present inside the key space, we'll use this describe key spaces command, which is very similar to uh, what you have in SQL, where you say describe table or describe database. So once you run it, you'll find that initially there were all the system-based key spaces available, but now it has created this user data key space. And using all these commands, we have pushed these tables inside the key space. So if once we say describe key space, and then we put the key space name here and load it into the tables. Okay, Meg has some issue. Uh, okay, so Meg, what it, you can uh, wait for like, let's say two or three minutes and, 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 and then try it again because Cassandra takes some time after you type the command, it takes some time to like run correctly. Or probably restart your Jupyter notebook and try it again. Okay, and once we have the idea that what tables are present in our key space, these are preference data, user activities, and user profiles, uh, we can try to query one such uh, key space. Let's say if we want to know what are the entries in user profiles. So we know that we haven't added anything yet, so this should just return nothing. And it returns nothing because we haven't added any data yet. So now we will add some sample data inside and, and that's why we installed that faker library. So just to create some fake profiles for this tutorial. So once we have this UUID, which is a library to create hash, hash, hash values, to have a unique ID associated with each entry. And once we run this, it will put a uh, thousand entries into our user profiles key space. And once this is done, we can start querying. And now we say that, okay, select star from the user profile. So now we are saying that select all the entries from this user profile, but just show 20. So once we run it, we'll see, okay, like it has run now. And now we can see that each each entry is a, a name and a last, first name and a last name of a person. They are associated with an email, like we have described here, their age, and and there is a unique ID associated with them. And similarly, we will push some activities uh, into the user uh, user activities key space. So what what this what this code will do is that it will for each of the IDs present here in the user profile, it would add some 
some of the activities for each one of the user. Okay, so let's run this. Okay, and now we, so once we have pushed some of the, uh, our fake data into your user activities, we can go and query. So, so this command again simply says select everything from user activities, but just for the display purpose, because you have pushed 10,000 results, you just want to see the top 10. So now you can say, okay, and now it runs, say that they have an activity ID, which is a unique ID and what kind of activity it is. There is some detail about it and what's the timestamp and 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 who which user is associated with that activity. And similarly, okay, and similarly, we can push uh, some of the preference data inside. So, what we are pushing here is like, let's say if the user has a UI, so what theme they prefer. So we can choose between like dark and light or or between languages, whether they prefer English or Spanish or French or, uh, or German. So uh, we can run this command here. And once this is done for all the user IDs, it push some values for each one of the user. And we can query again, preference data. And oops, one sec. Um, yes. So, and then once we, and we can query it using a similar query, which says select everything from preference data and just show the top 10 result. And once we run it, we'll see that for each one of the user, we have a language and a theme. And, and you will notice that the order remains the same that here in, in the user profiles uh, key space, we have this a uh, person with 865 and then they have this this unique id here so and we can we find that once we go to the user preference we have the same same person here associated with a language and a theme here okay and now we have only two attributes here but later we will update one entry without explicitly defining the schema so that's that that's the point where it differs from a SQL database is that even in the same table, you can have different schema for each row. So for example, if you want to insert something for this, this person, then you can have one attribute to it, but then that would not be present for the other users. Okay, so going back to our uh, discussion on the CRUD, uh, mechanism, we'll look at some examples. So all this, we have looked at all the create uh, create stuff, that how do you create a key space and push data into it. Now we'll look at the read part. So now you're interested in looking at, let's say selecting all of the user profiles. So this query will help you to say all the, uh, select everything from user profiles and and if, if you would like to verify that how many rows are there, what you can do is convert it in, into a list because uh, the Cassandra object doesn't return a list. So you need to convert it to use this length operation here. Or the other way would be that you can use a count around this select star thing. So let's run this. Okay, now, and then it says there are around 1000 entries. And what difference the difference between a, a returning a list and a result set which is a cassandra object is that it's not saved into the memory or it's not an iterator so you cannot just call a length or uh, and say that okay go one by one and uh, show me the names so what you have to do is run it again and now we will try to print the first 10 entries here and like you can see that we we were we are able to see like the top ten entries uh, present in the user profiles. Okay, now we can uh, do some filtering here. So since every time you run this uh, notebook, it gives just gives you a different set of uh, randomly generated names or ages and emails. So we'll just pick the first one, and then based on this, we can just 
we will run the other queries. So for example, this is from a previous run and then if I replace it and then say that select this, select everything for this user and then we are now mentioning the user ID. So this is exactly same as how the query in SQL that you would say for given that you are querying user profiles key space and wherever this user ID matches, you want to know everything for that entry. So once we do session dot execute under the Cassandra query language command here, and once you run this, it will say, oh, that's the entry or that's the result I found. And, and you can verify that that's the first entry for uh, this patient. Okay, okay. The another thing is that we cannot really do a lot of filtering based mechanisms in Cassandra because uh, it's not as like a relational database and things are not indexed. So, and that's when the concept comes in that you need to know your queries before you design your database schema. And that's where the Cassandra differs from your SQL databases. So for example, if we have this like uh, filtering here, uh, uh, filtering for activities for a specific user, it should give, give us error because instead of the user profiles key space where it will just return one entry, there is a possibility that uh, this user has multiple activities logged in. So if I run this, it will it should give me error, which say that I cannot do a filtering because now it has to compare uh, this user ID with all of the user IDs available in the user activities key space and then uh, return me the result so there are some alternatives that and and why there are alternatives because cassandra restricts certain type of queries because if if it, if it uh, thinks that there is a lot of data set to be filtered and then show then it can degrade per performance because now you're doing a full table scan like your scanning table from the top to the bottom and whatever matches your criteria then you're filtering those out so instead, there are several ways uh, around this problem. The first one is that you, you adjust your data model. So we'll, we'll look at one example in the later that what, what I mean by data model for now I can, uh, so we can have a secondary index uh, so that based, we can make a index on the user ID in the activities. So this command where we have a secondary index on, uh, user ID in the user activities key space. Once we run it, say we have created a secondary uh, secondary key, and if if we want to see if the index exists or not, so what we can do is we can describe the table here, and it will show us that it has. Uh, one row here which is the key space itself and then we have this index the another row which is which i have highlighted which say that it's a type of an index so because of index indexation now it can just quickly filter things and and now if i run this yeah ideally it should work yeah so now we were able to run the same query like if you see earlier, we had the same query, but it gave us error, but just making a one change where we provide an extra index on this user ID column in our user activities table. And when we run it, we, we are able to filter all those activities associated with this user. And, and then another alternative is the use of fil allow filtering, but it has performance implications that since you, it will do a full table scan without making a secondary index, secondary key, then then probably it, it will slow down all of your database. And so again, what another example where it, it provides an error that now we are trying to filter user profiles based on age. And there are many, many uh, user profiles available with, uh, uh, between the age of 20 and 30. So once we run it and it gave us error and the error it gives that Cassandra cannot execute this query because 
it has unpredictable performance. So now, uh, just as an example, we will think, okay, we can allow filtering here and we will run the same query, but but there is an extra allow filtering part here. And if you, we run this, then it provides us all the entries inside this user profile key space between this age 20 and 25 here. Yeah, however, like I said, allow filtering is not recommended because it's a very slow operation. Okay, going to some other uh, uh, read-based queries. So right now we want to know how many entries are there for one such user. So to change this to uh, the first user we had here. Uh, here, J. Jones was our first user inside your key space. So we copied the user ID and then if we put it here, here then it will show us like, okay, so now we know that, okay, for, for this person or this user, we have eight entries in the user activities key space. Okay, coming to string matching, where sometimes you try to filter your database uh, based on string. Uh, like for example, in SQL databases, let's say you want to know uh, all the users with some specific, whose name starts with specific letter. Uh, like for example, you want to know all the users whose name starts with an A. So this operation is not supported in Cassandra uh, because you need to de design a database based on the queries or what kind of queries you want to run. So Cassandra doesn't support SQL live like operations like match here and there based on string and it's not recommended for large data sets so if we run this let's say we have uh, user profiles here and what we will do is uh, make a new table and the tab the table would contain some information derived from these tables with uh, another column which will say name initial. So that's what I meant by design your uh, schema based on your queries that now when the need uh, arises that you want to have or want to run uh, some query which says all the or get all the users whose name starts with an A, then, then you have to change your uh, data table or the number of tables or what tables you have and then then run the query so right now what we are doing is uh, getting all the users and then we are extracting their name initial and then based on that information we are creating another table here and then and, and right now we are creating a table which names user profile by initials and once we have this running so now we have created the schema for this new table and once we run this uh, it will populate some data inside the table. And once this is done, yeah, once this is done, uh, we can query our query the new table we created and then we can filter it saying that from this new table which we have just created, filter all those users whose name starts with an A and once we run it, it just gives us like all those users whose names start with an A and we, just to verify that we can see the names like Angela, Aid, Adam, Adam, and then there's all those users available has a start name, uh, the letter A for their first name. Now, we can, so after uh, create and read, we can look at update operations. So for example, the first, the person, uh here who was the person yeah this person jane jones she had this uh user id and now we would like to or, or let's say if they are logged in and they are trying to update their email address so what queries you need to run so what would you do is you will run uh okay let's do this thing first let's print what email right now associated with that person so once we run this, we get that this person, Jane Jones, has this uh, email ID which just said fbird at the rate example.net and now we would like to update it. So 
the command is very similar to a SQL command which says update user profiles and now I want to set this email column or email attribute to this uh, this string wherever this user ID matches uh, this person. So if I say that, okay, go and match and then now I'll just change the name here and say Jane Jones and once I run it, so what it does is that it just finds that person and then replaces their current email ID, which was fbear.example.net by uh, an updated email ID. So just to verify, we can run this uh, read query where we go to user profiles key space and filter and we run this and see that. Yeah, it's not updating this. Yeah, and now once we run this, it should sh it should tell you that okay now instead of fbear.example.net once we updated the email ID now it's set to another email ID in which we set in the previous step. Okay, now this is this is uh, so next step is uh, about how Cassandra differs from SQL database is that it's not that the schema. Uh, is is limited or like the schema should be predefined. What you can do is you can dynamically update the schemas here. What, what I mean by that is that for this person here, let's say initially they were only language and theme. These are the two attributes for in their preference table. Now, now we would like to add another preference where we say that if whether they have notifications enabled or not. So what we would do is say update preference data. So it's saying that go and update this this uh, this key space and set preference equal to whatever preference was already there and then you add this uh, key value pair inside that uh, the, inside that dictionary wherever you find this user ID matching with this string. So once we run this, and now we can, what we can do is query for the same person here. Again, so once we run this, okay, and so now we can see that, okay, we have a, a new set of uh, uh, attributes of preferences for this person available. And now if we run the preference data again, we should see that let's say out of our 10 results, nine of them still follow the old schema where there was language and theme. But now you have introduced another attribute notifications for this person, but it's not present in uh, for other users. Imagine that if you have to do the same with SQL, then you have to introduce the same for everyone or just say that it's not available, but you still have that attribute available or not. So you still have that column, but there won't, won't be any data. So you'll be wasting space there. So, and this example illustrates that there is no fixed schema for Cassandra. Now looking at delete operations. So again, you can just get the 10, top 10 results from user profile. And delete operation here again follows that if we delete something, so it's just saying that delete go to this key space and wherever you find this user ID, just delete. So for example, let's say we just try to delete the entry for the person here. So here, and then if I run this, it should delete that person. And, and then if I run the same command here, we will not find uh, the person da Daniel here, because like if you see here, it's that Daniel was available here, but once we have deleted their information, it's uh, it's not it's not here uh, present here. And this this may be useful when if, if like somebody is trying to leave your platform, then you want to delete this information. Okay, another example is delete specific preference for one user. So from preference data last like in the last previous step, we see that we introduce this notifications enabled attribute for this person. So now if we want to get rid of this, so again, we can just go and copy the user ID. And now we would say that update the preference ID where you would like to delete this 
uh, notifications for this person. Okay. Oh, let me update this. Yep. So now we would like to delete this attribute for this this user here, and then once we run this, it should be able to delete uh, that attribute. And we once we once we run this, we see that okay for this uh, uh, this user whose this ID ends in three double two. Here we do not uh, have that notification, so you can see the difference in the first first result here versus here. They are the same user, but since we have performed a delete operation, the attribute is absent. Okay, now we can look at uh, some advanced commands uh, commands in Cassandra that you can uh, define your own data types in Cassandra. So, for example, you want to uh, create a new column where you would have a address data type, which would just uh, club the street, city, and text and zip code together and make one data type for user address. So we run this one. Now it creates uh, this user data type. And now what we would like to do is that for every user in user profiles, we would like to add this new column where it says address and the data type is user address. Yeah, once you run this and now we query our user profiles key space. Yeah, so now now we see that okay for all those uh, users in this uh, user profiles we have this as address attribute present which was uh, absent before. Like for example, here we queried our user profile there was no address attribute available, but right now we we have that address attribute available here, and now we can based on the ID can have. This, this attribute present. So in the update user profiles command, what we'll do is that we would like to set this address for this person. So we'll say this person lives at 123 Cassandra Lane in database city. So now once we run this and try to query the data again, we should see that the person Jones had, uh, initially they were the address uh, feature was empty, but once we updated, so we could see the address available here. Yep, so yeah, that's the end of today's tutorial. Uh, please let me know if any questions.